That is salty. Genuinely, this is salty. That's crazy. Ah, oh man. This doesn't taste like salt, but that doesn't mean we're not in store for another great episode of Invasive Species. In this series, I take an invasive species of tree and use it to make a vase, all while telling you more about the plant, some fun facts, and what makes it so invasive. For today's episode, it's the tamarisk tree, also known as the salt cedar. The log I have for this one is a really cool one. Larger tamarisk trunks like this one often grow into a really irregular shape, and I really want to try to preserve that shape if I can. So I'm going to try to experiment a bit with the vase shape in this episode, do something a little bit wild and funky and different from what I've done in the past. So I hope you stick with me to the end. Let me know if I pull it off. But in the meantime, we've got some really interesting things to talk about with this tree. All right, the tamarisk. This wispy shrub-like tree is native to Europe and Asia. Some species are more like shrubs and bushes, while others grow to more of a small to medium-sized tree, but both types were originally brought to North America as an ornamental. And it's easy enough to see why. What with those thin scaly needles and feathery pink flowers, it can be a striking addition to a yard or garden, which is where you're most likely to see it both in its native range or most other places where it's been introduced or naturalized. But throughout the American West in particular, it's become something of a nightmare. To first understand how this happened, let's go back to the 1800s. As colonizers expanded in the American West, they were looking for ways to keep rivers from eroding areas in which they planned to build railways and roads. See, in the arid West, as rivers like the Green or the Colorado change flow rates from one one season to the next, their banks can change size and shape dramatically. One way to help prevent that from happening is to line those banks with an impenetrable thicket of plants, and a prime candidate for that job ended up being the tamarisk. A tree that grew quickly and thickly, it did help prevent rivers from carving away the sandy soil underneath railways and roads, but surprise, surprise, in no time at all it began to spread, choking rivers and streams far beyond its initial intended location. Locations. Ah! <laughs> I'm currently here in the San Rafael Swell, probably my favorite geological formation named after a ninja turtle. And even here in this extremely remote location, the banks of this river are being overrun by this invasive tree. As with any species that makes the jump from being introduced or naturalized to being categorized as fully invasive, it took a specific set of circumstances in that region. First, obviously, the tamarisk spread rapidly and effectively, moving up and downstream and into very remote places. Once established in a new habitat, they're easily able to outcompete native species either by taking root in spots where very little native flora likes to grow, or by simply growing faster and more vigorously than the native trees of the area. Area. They also use deep roots to draw a lot of salt up from underground and into their leaves. This is how they got the nickname Salt Cedar. As those leaves then fall back to the ground, they add an excess amount of salt into the topsoil, which prevents native grasses and trees from being able to grow in the area. Out here in the American Southwest, these riparian zones should primarily be cottonwoods, willows, and other types of trees, but instead they're being choked out by this thirsty thicket of tamarisk trees. Not only do they spread wide, far, and fast, but once they take hold, they're extremely difficult to kill and remove. They resist herbicides, and if you cut them back, they respond by growing even more shoots. The most effective modern method of control has been introducing tamarisk beetles. These little fellows are one of the many things that help keep this plant in check in its native range as they feed only on the leaves of the tamarisk. After a thorough and lengthy research process to determine that the beetles wouldn't just start feeding on other trees if there are no tamarisks left, they were rolled out as a biological control agent in problem areas. Basically, larvae are applied to the trees, they eat all the leaves, completely defoliating it. Once the food source is all gone, the beetles simply die off. This doesn't kill the tree immediately though, the leaves do grow back and more larvae are applied, killing the tree typically after three to five years of treatment. This method of control has shown some promising results in areas, but we are a long ways off from reclaiming our riverbanks. The tamarisk is listed as an invasive species in nine states, and if you spend time around major rivers in the west, it's clear just what a nuisance this tree is. Blocks off access to rivers, turning former sandy beaches into scratchy, salty thickets. As previously mentioned, they stifle competition, which damages ecosystems and creates unhealthy monocultures. And last but not least, there's strong evidence that they're siphoning off a lot of extra water in regions that can ill afford it. 
I'd like to send a special thanks to the many conservationists doing the hard work to control and remove this tree. I've spent time on these rivers and seen just how out in the middle of nowhere some of these stands of tamarisks are, and I know that it can't be easy work. So just know we see and appreciate you. Okay, this vase is about done. Like I said at the jump, I wanted to try something pretty different this time. Uh, I was mainly trying to keep the shape of the outline of the trunk. I had no idea how I'd go about doing that when I put the log on the lathe, and this is just the shape that came out of it. So, I, I don't know. I'll tell you what helps a lot, though, is that grain and that color. I mean, come on, just look at it. Also, hey, hey, check this out. There's even a tiny bit of chatoyancy. Time to add it to the invasive collection next to the tree of heaven and Bradford pear. And it's looking pretty good there. So let me know which species we should cover next.